So, uh, you know, it's all good. It's good to see you guys today. Thanks for being here. Super Bowl weekend. Anybody excited? Anybody care? Okay. I mean, how many, you really care? Does anybody have a team still in the game? No. No. <laughs> no. We're just getting, okay. Anybody? Okay. Let's just see. So do you care who wins? Cincinnati fans? Cincinnati fans? Okay. A few uh, Rams fans? About the same number. Chicken wing fans? There we go. That's what we're all about. Taquito fans, right? Right, Garrett? Yes, taquito fans. There we go. You know, it's, it's an interesting time, right? Because we, we not only have the Super Bowl tonight, Olympic fans out there, anybody just like faithfully watching? The, who, who actually subscribed or got the free trial of Peacock so you have the unending stream of Olympics all the time? I saw that hand very quickly, but I saw that hand. You know, not every, I, I realize that not everybody here is a sports fan. Some of you probably tolerate sports for the people you love. I get that. Uh, but I think we can all agree. There is something special like when we see our team win, right? right? I mean, it's like, especially when you watch the Olympics, regardless of what country you may be from, when your country does well, when you see them bring home the goal, there's a sense of pride in that, right? There's a sense of, yes, I'm excited. And, you know, as we watch the Olympics, we love to see these stories of triumph. You know, we love to see when people do really well, and especially if we see a comeback. Anybody like to see a good comeback? I have a good friend. His, his expression is, they don't make Disney movies about people that were always ahead. And that's true, right? Amen. Give it. That's, that's Luke McDonald's famous expression right there. So that's true. But we love these things. Now, growing up a um, hundred years ago, I remember before we had all these 24-hour streaming sports channels like ESPN, ESPN2, ESPNU, ESPN8, the Ocho, before all those existed, we had what was called ABC's Wide World of Sports. Anybody remember that? Oh, there we go. And you watch that on Saturday, and what they would do is they would showcase these sports from all around the world, things that you most likely never would get to watch because, you know, it wasn't football or baseball or the big stuff. So they'd bring in things from around the world. But what I remember about that show is their tagline, their catchphrase. Do you guys remember it? The thrill... Oh, man. And, and what comes to your mind when you say that? The guy falling off. That is exactly right. I had to show my kids that. The other day, we were watching Olympic ski jump, and I'm like, what is this deal where you have tracks to follow down the ski jump? I remember the day where you could go careening off the side of that thing and kill yourself. I mean, now, I mean, now it's just easy. Just, oh, man, just hold on for the ride. No kidding. Very easy. <laughs> But if you didn't watch it, what the, the, they, they talked about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And when it said the agony of defeat, you saw this guy coming down a ski jump and somehow missing or turning. And he does. He goes screaming off the side of the ski jump in this horrible crash. And so we, we see that. And I, and I remember that. Those are the emory, memories that sit in my head. But it made me start thinking about just some highlights and maybe some not so highlights in sporting events this past year. Watch the screen. Rippling a little too quickly for the for the handler. Just down goes the handler. Oh, falls on the floor, oh. ripple. But look how sweet that dog is. He's the checking on him. But who did like you see the floof and you boop the floof <laughs> and then the floof left you back. So bad. Believe in the 710. The 710 only been made on television three times in the history of professional bowling. On TV. Come on, kid, do it. Oh, he did it! He got the 710, Randy! These guys are very excited about the 710. Anthony Rondon split. hits his fly ball. Shallow left. Luis Robert thinks he has it. Oh! Off his head. Allowing the runner to score. Embarrassing, but yes, we must show it again. Somebody else in. He actually got a double play on that oh one. Oh, my. Five seconds. Oh, it's okay. Three different times. Like, one is bad. Two is, is, is painful, but three, we've crossed over into the, the funny territory. It's personal. I feel like it does it's feel personal. personal because it's the same guy. Oh, he spills it. A bicycle from Australia. Oh, That's impressive right there. That is just impressive. <laughs> 
basics. When you're the quarterback, generally speaking, mm -hmm. you line Sorry, up Vikings behind fans. the center. Oh, that's right. Except for Kirk Cousins decided to line up behind the wrong guy. And look, <laughs> they're even telling him, like, scooch over, dude. You're behind. <laughs> scooch over, scooch over. And Kirk just stands there relatively confused. Like, what are you talking about? Pirates. Keep Ryan Hayes. Watch this. Homer for the Pirates. Kind of a rare circumstance for them. Everything's great, right? Wrong. Oh. Baseball basics. Dude. Get there. Got to follow. And they do. He got it. He fouled him. Didn't get him. And give Shea Gilgis Alexander credit as Devontae sends it. Oh! Gets it. Gets it. Oh, the game That's winner. awesome. Oh, wow. Devontae Graham stuns him in Oklahoma. City. Just how you drew it up. Not good. By the way, this was terrible. Connor Awful. McGregor, first pitch. I, I keep wondering, was that on purpose? I think so, because there's no possible way you can be that bad. Yes, Oh, what was that? The switch double backflip? Did he clip the knuckle? Sets hard. Does he clip? He hits his tips. No way. He goes no. all the way. Touchdown. My least favorite thing that happens in football Why right here. Why did you do that? Throws up the ball to celebrate early. And no. And look at him. <laughs> oh. Just been played in February. Tweener to tweet. This is our World Cup qualifiers. It's Canada and Haiti. And Jose Duverge <laughs> just like he just whips. <laughs> and then he whips again. A 66-yard try. Tucker's kick is on the way. It is good. It's crossbar. And it tumbles through. It is good. Time has expired. Justin Tucker with the longest field goal in NFL history. The hay is in the barn. <laughs> you got to love how excited the announcers get. Now, you may be wondering, do, am I just now showing you like the, my favorite videos that I've watched throughout the ye week? Maybe. But uh, no, what in the world does this have to do with following Jesus or the Bible? Well, as we've said the last few weeks, we've been in this series we're calling Crossroads. What happened at the cross? Because there's different things as we've seen that as we look at the cross, we can take away from what actually happened. And today, we're going to add one more aspect to this to see where the cross, where it looks like defeat... It really is victory. It's this celebra I mean, it's this incredible moment. It's this paradox that when we look at the cross, maybe what we think and expect is happening is not actually happening. And this is actually a view of atonement that's been around for 2,000 years. It dates back even to the first century church, and it's called Christus Victor, or Christ the Victor. That's the name of this view right here. What happened at the cross? And this one should be an easy one for us to understand because just like we see in the video, yeah, we love it when people screw up and we laugh at that. But when our team wins, we really love that. We want to be on the winning side. In fact, we create these hashtags, you know, like hashtag winning or hashtag FTW, right, for the win. Uh, we, we create that. And the idea of Christus Victor should be easy for us to get around because what it says, as it's the oldest view of the atonement that's been around, it says that when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't defeat. It was actually... The, the triumphing over the evil powers of the world. And the work of Christ on the cross is first and foremost a victory over the powers which hold mankind in bondage. So it's victory over sin and victory over death and victory over the devil even. And we find this idea fleshed out for us in a lot of different passages in the New Testament. Like in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, John writes this, he says, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. I mean, take what he's saying there. The reason the son of God appeared, is he being hyperbolic? Maybe, but he's definitely wanting us to understand something significant happened at the cross, that the reason Jesus came, the reason that he existed was to destroy the works of of the devil. Okay, that seems to be pretty clear, right? I mean, Jesus came, destroy it, put a stop to it. The, the adversary that we have, that's, what, that's the goal. That was the objective. Or we can go to Hebrews, 
where we see in Hebrews chapter 2, we see that writer of the book of Hebrews saying this. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared, Jesus shared in their humanity, so that by his death he may break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who uh, all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. I mean, don't you love that imagery? That he may come in and he may break the power of the devil and free those who were in slavery. What powerful imagery we have there. And then there's one more passage we could go to, and it's in Colossians chapter 2, the apostle Paul writing these words where he says this. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. Now, think back a couple of weeks ago when Pastor Amy was talking. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. He forgave our sins. He canceled the debt. He stood against everything that condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And then listen to what he wraps this up by saying. And having disarmed the powers and authorities... He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing triumphing over them by the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but I read enough of these, and it's like your team winning the Super Bowl, right? I mean, it's like this should get us a little bit excited. I mean, this is the stuff that's like, wow, okay, what is going on here? This is exciting because we don't always think about our faith in these terms of winning and victory. But evidently, as you read through the New Testament, these are just a few examples, we see that this was an important idea that the first century church grasped onto. I mean, again, look at the words that these writers, three different writers in three different letters to different groups, look at the words that they used when he talks about destroying, breaking the power, disarming the powers, all a very important message for those first century Christians to be able to hear. Think about for a moment, why would this have been important? Why would the first century church have needed to hear this? Well, because what they looked at, when they saw around them, they did begin to see actual oppressive forces by the government. I mean, we've talked a little bit about that with crucifixions and the arena and and all these things. There was actually some things happening around them physically. But they saw something that I think we forget about today, or we may choose not to think about They saw the destructive forces in the cosmic battle around them. They recognized that evil was real, and there was a power to evil. And as Jewish people, they understood what it meant to be enslaved and oppressed. And so this idea of freedom and breaking the power and experiencing this freedom would have been a message that they wanted to hear. But unfortunately for us, I think we've become a little too sophisticated we're a little too smart. We're a little too enlightened because we would look at something like this and we think about disarming the powers and authorities and we go, those are just backward Jewish rednecks, basically. They're just uneducated. They don't know enough. If they knew what we knew in our sophistication, they would not be so bound up in this. And yet, what I think is, what I think is it's time for us to reclaim some of this we need to reclaim this. I'm not, and I'm not saying we put aside 2,000 years of science and, investment and, and advancement and start believing again that, oh, there's evil in the seas or whatever. But what the writers of the New Testament have done is they've, it's kind of the Wizard of Oz. They've pulled back the curtain and they've allowed us to see something that we may not want to see, that we may think we're too smart or sophisticated to see, but they want us to understand that there is a realm beyond what our physical eyes can see. There are powers and authorities at work in the world around us. And they're not telling us this because they want us to live in fear, like, oh my gosh, there's a demon under every rock. No, just the opposite. They're wanting us to know this because they want you to know that even though there may be powers, Jesus has already taken care of it. We don't live in fear. We don't live as going, oh, what if a demon gets me? Jesus has already taken care of that on the cross. And I think we need to step back a little bit. And instead of being too sophisticated for understanding powers and authorities and evil in this world, we need to say, yes, it exists. And we live and move in the victory of the cross, that Jesus Christ is the victor. 
that what he accomplished on the cross is incredible. And the freedom from oppression that Jesus brought to them is the same that he brings to us today. We have that freedom. We have that deliverance from sin. We can have and experience victory over death and the grave. And it's as relevant for us today as it was 2,000 years ago. The challenge for us, I think, is exactly in what Paul says. Did you catch verse 15 of that Colossians passage? I'm going to put it on the screen again. Look at what Paul writes. He says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, does anybody else look at that and go, Well, that seems just a little bit backwards. I mean, let's think about this. He made a public spectacle of them. That, that can't be right. I mean, let's think about crucifixion as what it was. It began with being stripped of either all your clothes or most of your clothes, depending on which interpretation you look at. Then there was a public flogging, which just destroyed your body. You had to carry your cross to a place where they would crucify you, nailing you to that wooden beam, lifting that beam in the air, possibly naked, leaving you there in full public view for you to die. People could come along. They could throw things at you. They could hurl insults at you. They could spit at you. Your crimes were posted around you so people knew exactly what you were, had been crucified for. And you most of the time, or all the time, this was done publicly. You know why? Because this was called a deterrent. So that when you walked by and you saw uh, Amy talk back to her mother, there she is on the cross, guess what you didn't do? You didn't talk back to your mother. It was a, a crim, crime deterrent. In fact, Cicero, the Roman statesman and scholar, described crucifixion this way. He said it was a most cruel and disgusting punishment. That's somebody from the time. And so the whole point of crucifixion was to break you down emotionally, mentally, and physically, to absolutely humiliate you in front of the world. So how is it possible, or let me just ask this question, who was the public spectacle? I mean, Paul has his opinion. We see what crucifixion is. Do you think that as the world looks at this, what happened to Jesus, that they go, oh, well, it's very clear. Jesus, absolutely, he taught them a lesson. No. You look at it and you go, well, the public spectacle, Jesus was the one humiliated. Jesus was the one put to shame. And think about this, though. This is confusing maybe for us to think, how is that possible? But a first century disciple might be confusing for them as well. Because not only do they see what's happening to Jesus, they also have verses like Deuteronomy 21, 23 in their minds, where they had grown, learned it growing up, that it said that cursed is anyone that is hung on a tree. Okay, well, we've just seen Jesus on a tree, so obviously he's the one cursed. Therefore, he can't be the Messiah. But, that, but even though they may have had these thoughts staying in their mind, it's very clear they didn't stay there. It's very clear that there was something different, something changed in them. Because when the first century followers of Jesus looked at the cross, they didn't see defeat. They saw victory. What is it that led them to that? They saw the evil of the world, the powers and the oppressors. They were defeated. They were the ones defeated and put to shame. And this is the paradox of the cross. This is the part of the cross that doesn't make sense. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians, where he says the world looks at the cross and they call it foolishness. I mean, look at the screen uh, in the, the verse here, 1 Corinthians 1. And Paul's writing and he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing or dying, but to those of us who are being saved is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a sign. Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Again, notice the terms here, Christ crucified. He's not even saying Christ resurrected. We're going to talk about that in a second. But he says Christ crucified is the power, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Holy cow! What are they looking at? What are they seeing? 
that when we look at it, it's easy for us to go, well, Jesus was defeated. He was the one put to shame, and they're going, oh, 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 no, no, no. Because here's the thing. It is a paradox, but it's a reminder for us that when we look at the cross, we need to remember that looks can be de- deceiving. Just because the, something may look a certain way doesn't mean that's how it is. That's what faith, that's what Christian living is all about. That when all seems lost, when a situation seems hopeless, God can still be moving. He's still in control. He's still for us. And what may look like certain defeat in our lives can actually be victory. That's what the cross is. And if we're tempted, as I said earlier, if we're tempted to look at the cross as defeat, and we hold out and we say, well, and the resurrection is where the victory was. No. Look at how they're talking about this. It's very clear. They see the cross as the victory. I mean, we would, we would much rather think maybe one was death and one was victory. But no, the cross is where the powers were defeated. And the phrasing that Paul uses here to talk about triumphing over the, the evil and the, and the powers and authorities, the image that goes with that, that the, that the early church would have seen, would be a Roman general coming home after a conquest, marching triumphantly through the city, displaying the spoils of war, leading prisoners through the streets in a public spectacle. And that's what Paul is saying Jesus did when he died on the cross. The cross, the power of God, not just the resurrection, but the cross itself. The cross is our victory. And what Paul is reminding us is that we no longer have to be beaten down by sin. We no longer have to give the power in our lives, be, be subject to the power of evil in our lives. We can come out of the darkness and step into the light. No longer slaves, no longer in bondage, set free by the power of Jesus of the cross, on the cross through his death. Isn't that amazing? Should get us excited. Should get us, wow, this is amazing. Because it, it turns everything we want to believe about life on its head. That just because things look one way, they may not be. I do want you to understand, too, I think the reason I relate heavily to the Christus Victor view is because, not only because it was around a long time, but when you begin to look through the Bible and you try to understand where did this come from, you can trace the, the picture of this all the way back to the beginning in the garden in Genesis. Think back to Genesis, that Garden of Eden. You know, uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and God comes to the garden, and he starts looking for them. And what does Adam say to God? Where are you, Adam? And Adam says, you know, well, you know, he says, we're hiding. And God says, well, why are you hiding? And Adam says, well, it's, you know, the, the, the serpent deceived me. And God responded to Adam. And listen to what he says. He says to the serpent, cursed are you above all livestock, above all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all, your day, all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And look at this. And he, the offspring of the woman, will crush your head. That in Genesis chapter 3 is this first glimpse of the plan of God that is going to come about. And you know what? You look through the Old Testament and you see this roller coaster ride of people living in victory and experiencing the prosperity and the blessings of God and turning their back on God and just, you know, feeling powerless to the effects of sin. And right here, you look back and you go, but from the beginning, God's design was to destroy that which has destroyed humanity, that which separated us from God. It's always been his plan to crush the head of the serpent. The seeds of Christ the victor right there. And the impact of this is so far-reaching. It's not just that we have freedom today, although we do, and aren't we praising God for that. And it's not just that we have victory over sin, and aren't we praising God for that. But even the things we haven't experienced yet, like death and the grave, there's victory over that. And I mean, the Apostle Paul, again, he really understood this. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, listen to what Paul says about death. He says, death has been swallowed up in what? Oh, say it again. Death is swallowed up in? There it is. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But thanks be to God. He gives us, us, you, me, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what God had predicted in Genesis has come to pass. 
And let me just tell you, and this isn't a sword-carrying, butt-kicking, name-taking feat of Jesus. It is in surrender and sacrifice at the cross. Jesus slammed his foot down on the head of the evil one, Satan, the accuser. And he defeated the powers of darkness once and for all. And to provide our release from oppression to freedom, from darkness to light, from power of Satan to the power of God, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? Oh, my goodness. This should get us very excited. One author put it this way. said, we are saved from the power of God's archenemy, saved from the destruction that would have been the inevitable consequences of our sin, saved from our fallen inability to live in right relatedness with God, saved from the idolatrous, futile striving to find life from the things of this world, saved from our meaningless, meaninglessness, and saved to forever participate in the fullness of life, joy, power, and peace that is the reign of the triune God. Woo. All right, let's get excited now. You see, this is an often overlooked aspect of the cross, but it should encourage us. And also challenge us because it means that if we're living in these defeated states, we need to start asking why. Why are we giving these things power over over us? You've been redeemed. You've been transformed. And this should move us to a place of radically following Jesus. So I want you to stop and think for just a moment right now. Think about your life and think about Christ the victor. Are there areas of your life right now where that feel like defeat? Think about that. Is there an area of your life where you hear this message and you think that's great for somebody else? That's great for you, Brent, but not for me. Can you identify what may be causing defeat in your life or at least causing you to experience that defeat? And are you willing this week to kind of just focus on that, to pray through it, to see how God can take what feels like defeat and bring victory out of it? I want you to do that. I want you to make that uh, a priority this week. In fact, Liz, in the newsletter this week, that needs to be one of the questions. What is looking like defeat and how are you identifying it, releasing it to God? And then I want you to share it with someone Share it with someone. Now, I get it. That's scary. It means you have to be vulnerable. It means you have to open up and actually admit to some other human that you're not perfect. I get it. It's hard. But part of finding the victory is relying on other people to help bring you through. So I'm going to wrap this up today. And what I hope you're seeing through this series. We've got one more week. We're going to talk about what it means to live under the cross next week. But in the last three weeks, in these three sermons that we've done on this, what I want you to understand is that when we look at the cross of Jesus, we don't just look at one aspect and say, this is what happened when Jesus died. You see, I think some in the theological world are inclined to do this. They find their their view of theology or view of atonement that they like, and they just cling on to it. And they, they, they crack, just say, that's the only thing that happened. And that's just not true. There's more than one thing that happened, and there's more than one thing in the cross that makes up the gospel. We don't have to be beholden to one. There was a lot taking place on the cross. And remember, we're talking about atonement, that good church word that can be broken down to be at one month, which means our sins were forgiven. We're taking that which was broken, our relationship with God, bringing it back together and seeing the powers defeated that were holding us captive. As I was studying this week, I ran across... uh, an article, and I thought, this brings it together so well. The last few weeks brings this together. Because he talked, this author wrote, and he says that the cross is aimed. What is the cross aimed at? And he said, the cross is aimed downward towards Satan, because that's the Christus Victor view, where the cross defeated, Jesus died to defeat Satan, who held the power of sin and death. But the cross also is aimed upward towards God, the salvation of sinners, that got Jesus satisfied the debt that we owed and paid the penalty for our sin. And that's what Amy spoke about in week one. And then the, the cross moves sideways towards us, provides us a picture of how much God loves us and how much Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example that we might follow him. Isn't that beautiful? 
to think about how the cross moves. Downward to crush Satan, upward for us to be forgiven, and sideways for us to experience the love of God. And all these things are critical for us to understand what Jesus did on the cross. So which one of those grabs you right now? Which one of those aspects impacts you the greatest in your journey of following Jesus? The, one thing, the last thing I want to ask you to do this week is just simply this. We're talking about the cross. Do a little examination of your life this week. How has the cross impacted your life or changed your life? How have you seen that reflected in how you live? Do you see the victory? Do you experience the forgiveness? Do you experience the love of God? How has the cross made a difference for you? Now, there may be some here today and you're, you've hear, heard these messages and you go, I, it hasn't, but I know it can. We're going to get ready to sing a final song. It's not a slow one. It's an upbeat one because we're celebrating in the victory of God this morning. We're going to sing from graves to gardens. But as we sing, I want you to think about the impact of the cross in your life. Are you living in that victory? Are you living in that forgiveness? Are you living in God's love? <clears throat> And if not, maybe you've never experienced that. I'm up here. Amy's on the stage. We'll grab her. Elizabeth is here. We want to talk to you about what it means to just take that first step in following Jesus because this is significant. You've never had anybody do what Jesus has done for you. You've never had anyone lay down their life for you. You've never had anybody pay that kind of a debt for you. You've never had anybody show you that kind of love before. And you've never had anyone bring you the victory that is available to you today than what Jesus has done for you. And we just want everybody to be able to live and experience and know that every day. Worship team, come, let's pray.